it takes us a while to get there. But today we talk about our staff cultural values, uh, what we are called to do um, as a staff first and foremost. Um, and then we, uh, we even get to some Spurgeon quotes. And so stay with us. It takes us a few minutes to get there, but let's do this thing. Welcome to the To Be The Church podcast, where we explore what it looks like to truly be the church in today's culture. Tyler, Ben, Andrew, the whole gang's back together. What's up? Um, yeah. I legitimately have no idea what we're going to be talking about. Me neither. I think we're all tired, worn out. Our heads are a little, um, you know, our heads are a little worn out, man. You just said there's nothing on the front burner, and I'm like, man, I don't think anything's burning right now. Mm. It's just like the flame is flickering, the, about to go out. Mm. Cool. Good night. <laughs> so if you have any questions. <laughs> it's not that we don't have questions, but, yeah, you know, we're just like, nah. So the big one right now um, is um, the Super Bowl. Mm. We do the, an episode like this once a year uh, because the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl every year. and But there come times, like in 2019 in January, and now, that was right when you were hired, where the Chiefs and Niners are two It teams. was about a year in, the 2020 Super Bowl. Yeah, it was the Super 2020 Bowl. Super Bowl, 2019 yeah. season. Oh, right. Because I remember uh, yeah. reading a, a, like a legitimate news headline that said Patrick Mahomes saved us from even worse COVID by winning. Because oh. like, there were people. Yeah, that with, really, yeah, that yeah. aged well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chiefs winning the Super Bowl are what broke the world in 2020. Last time that we picked a Super Bowl against the Chiefs, we were right. I actually saw that on a... TBTC against the Bucks. Oh. We both picked the Bucks, and they we did. They had a good defense yeah. that year. Yeah. yeah. So Tyler just told me before you came in here that he is extremely confident as of today. Really, more confident than any other playoff game so mm-hmm. far for the Chiefs. Well, yeah. Tyler is is perpetually confident in the Chiefs. Uh, that's what I would say about you. Yeah. You are you are always confident. Well, in Mahomes, we trust. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I mean, with a good QB, that's what you get. Yeah. 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 yeah, no, I've, these playoffs, I've legitimately been, like, like first game, I was worried, like, we're not going to win this game, like, the, against the Dolphins, and then we murdered the Dolphins, and then it was like, we're not, like, I'm a little bit scared of the Bills, this is the year, and then we didn't lose to them, and then, yeah, then, like, Lamar, I mean, Lamar's a beast, and he... Except in the playoffs. Did nothing, so... Yep. Yeah, but, like, yeah, so I have not been, so my confidence level has been low. But, like, the more I've read about this matchup, the more I'm like, oh, like, I actually feel good about this. Read from what vantage point? Uh, Chiefs.com? Yeah, Chiefshomers.com. No, <laughs> no, mainly national guys. But then also, Nick like, Wright. Uh, uh, yeah, Nick Wright, you know. Uh, Alex Smith, who was a quarterback for both these teams. Oh, um, wow. He's an ESPN analyst now. Objective. I, yeah. Um, definitely lean to him a little bit. But Well, we can talk about whatever we want now because no one's listening at this point. They turn exactly. it off. Um, exactly. Yeah. Do you guys know it's eight weeks till Easter? Mm. Easter's really early. Now, Ben, tell the listeners why Easter changes dates. Uh, you know, like sometimes it's April 15th. Sometimes it's April 2nd. Sometimes, like this year, it's in March, March 31st. So there's a reason why Easter changes why dates. Why don't you tell us then if you know the Tyler's reason. Tyler's Googling it. So no, no, I'm, I'm looking for a... a, 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 a um, it's always on a Sunday. I know that much. So it, it has to do with the moon. Mm. Um and uh, like the, the equinox or something, it's like here. Easter's I, I, exact date yeah. varies so much <laughs> because it actually be. depends on the moon. The holiday yeah, is yeah, set to coincide with the first Sunday of Paschal full moon, the first full moon after vernal equinox. So if you're into stuff like the Paschal full moon and the vernal equinox. Paganism and okay. astrology. Yeah. So and I didn't want to tell you guys why I was actually confident in the Chiefs but it was because of this tweet, which is actually a carryover to what you just mentioned. I was going to say, this is, is going to give me a case of vernal equinox, but yeah. go ahead. So here we go. <laughs> the preliminary lunar analysis certainly favors the Chiefs. The day of the Super Bowl is a waxing crescent moon, and the Chiefs are 19-1 and one in the last five years under waxing crescent conditions. By far their best moon phase. Wow, that's good. So, Are you scared now? Astrology on the To Be The Church <laughs> podcast. Uh, how is Easter determined each year? This is, a more, uh, this is an answer with more English words in it. Um, the simple standard definition of Easter is that it is the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after spring equinox. Hmm. Hmm. There you go. Well, this probably brought up a lot more questions. So if you have, <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> this is a great episode so far. I'm proud of us. Yeah. Have you guys ever heard of the comedian Dusty Slay? 
mm-hmm. like this like hillbilly guy with long hair. No. But he tells people, he says, like he'll like finish a joke and then he'll be like, we're having a good time. And then he, he says things like, some comedians come out here and ask, are we having a good time? He's like, not me. I can't risk it. He's like, so I got to tell you we're having a good time and it'll eventually be true. So you keep saying like, this is a great episode. You know? yeah. Yeah. It is. It is a yeah. great episode. You're still listening. <laughs> Easter can fall on any Sunday between March 22nd and April 25th. The date took millennia to standardize for surprisingly complex reasons. That's at livescience.com. Mm. Yeah, I think we can leave it there on Easter dating situations. So, uh, dude, hey, we haven't talked through Easter yet. Um, You are in a series right now in Genesis, Mm -hmm. the book of beginnings. We are in a series here at East Vancouver in 1 Samuel, or Samuel. And uh, what are you doing for Easter? Are you taking, you're taking um, Good Friday and Easter in a different direction? I mean, I'm guessing you're not like going to be in Genesis 5 for those, right? Right. Yeah, we're good. We're getting through Genesis three, and then we're taking a a pause, doing a three week uh, giving generosity series, then Holy Week, and then back finishing Genesis four through eleven, and that'll get us all the way to June. That's great. Uh, Holy Week, you're gonna do Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter. Mm-hmm. Where from? Don't know yet, bro. But I was actually thinking the other day. Actually, I was thinking when we when CW was closed uh, last Sunday because of ice, and we brought our people over to EV. I was thinking about when we did Good Friday together. That was cool. And I was like, we should do that. Like, we should get our congregations together more often than we do. Um, I think things like Good Friday um, are good for that. So maybe we should do something like that again. Come on over. But. We should do that this Good Friday. You come over, dude. When you <laughs> we'll do eight services. <laughs> when you, uh, that was the the gathering where you said um, <laughs> this could be your eighth Good Friday or your eight. What do you, how did you your say your first you? or your three hundredth? Yeah, good Friday. <laughs> this could be your first Good Friday. Yeah, or your three hundredth Good mm-hmm. Friday. And uh, yeah, right away I was like, this is great. And no three hundred year olds in the room yeah, apparently. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you you caught it though. And I can't remember how you recovered, but it was hilarious, however you recovered. And I remember because we both preached. You preached for mm-hmm. like 15, 20, and then I got up and mm-hmm. preached. Preach, and, and so, yeah, that was fun, dude. That was good. That was a good, yeah. good gathering. We should do that again. I think it helps our people and our leaders embrace the multi-church, too. Like, yeah. we're all together, and yeah, I don't know. I, I'd be up for it. Um, what are you doing for, are you staying in a book? No, we're in First Samuel leading up to that, and then Good Friday Easter we'll be we'll be doing something something else. So you will be finishing it on Palm Sunday. I will. Um, we're actually not finishing it. We're no, we're getting back or to it finishing after your, this section. Well, yeah. we're no, we're just gonna take a break for mm. that week and then yeah. come back for a few more weeks after. Yeah, yeah. So we'll finish out First Samuel um, this like it'll be like in May. It finishes, I think, April twenty mm-hmm. eighth. So, April twenty eighth. So, yeah, it's like the end of the book, the thirty first chapter. So. Mm. That's what we're doing there, um, but yeah, dude. So we should uh, we should get together for Good Friday Easter. I like it. Let's yeah. Do this thing. All right. So I do have something we can talk about. All right. Um, we here um, on the East Vancouver side of things, we kind of identified our staff cultural values um, late late last year, and uh, really the things that we've like been either striving for or living in. But it's like we need to. We have tons of new team members. We're adding new team members all the time. We need to like get these on paper so that they understand kind of what they're signing up for. Um, and uh, and we decided that starting today, actually, uh, we are going to do our staff teachings on just the line by line of those. And so there's five of the staff cultural values. There's uh, six bullet points per staff cultural value, kind of how they play out. And uh, and this morning we made it through. Uh, uh, value number one, bullet point number one. Um, and it was really good. And so, uh, our Thanks, staff, Ty. you're welcome. Our staff cultural really value impacted me. a um, lot. Well, you weren't here. That's why I want to talk about it. Um, uh, and so staff cultural value number one, and then again, these are staff values, like the people who get paid by the church and seem implied in this first value. The value is we get paid to equip the church. Like that's why we're here. We talk about it a lot on this podcast. Wait, you um, guys get paid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so the first bullet point is like, we understand that it's a privilege to, to uh, equip Jesus Church, right? And so you took the teaching in, an, in a direction that 
I wouldn't have anticipated. Yeah, you know? I, I wouldn't have either until I wrote it last night. Yeah, and so that's why I, w- yeah. I want to talk about is the like, spirit just took over, oh. tore up your notes, big, big time. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I want to talk about because like, um, like when when with that bullet point, there's a, a hundred different directions it could have gone, um, but it was actually like the perfect beginning for it. And so let's uh, let's chat about it. Um, cool. Yeah, tell tell us uh, kind of the even just like the where where you thought it was going to go and then how it ended up shifting. Yeah, we get paid to, to equip the church. So we came up with these these staff values at like an offsite, like you said. And I think that so, uh, and, and I even mentioned this in staff meeting today, but, but so much of the staff values or like the church values that we have, these are not things that we, we um, do in a hypothetical way, right? We, we don't, our process here over, I'm in my 14th year and like, when I first got here, there was this idea of like, okay, what's the mission? What's the vision? What are the the things we're going to put on paper? What are those kind of deals? And there was a real hunger to like put everything on paper in terms of the ideals or the theory. And we did. We established the core values. We did. We did all the things you kind of do when you're like working in leadership of a of any organization or a church. And so, and yet, like it wasn't it wasn't lived stuff. It was just stuff that sounded good on paper. And then we were going to try to try to equip the people to that end or whatever. But um, over the years, like as the church has grown and changed and, and all those things, just through the preaching of the word and, and, and everything that the Spirit's been doing at the church, like there's come a point, and I would say it was probably around year 10 or so, about three, four years ago, that I started to like look back on like what the Lord has done and who the Lord has made us. And at that point, we started to put more of that on paper. Like we redid our membership class about the time you came on staff, Ben, like we redid our membership class, NGC 101. We started putting together like the six pillars and all that kind of stuff. And, and these were things that we did it in a room with leaders who had, you know, were in key positions or, and especially those who had been in the church for a long time, Tyler, you were in on that. I wasn't on that. And, and so it wasn't about like, Hey, let's put something on paper and try to convince people that this is what we should do. It was more about who are we? And how have we how have we seen the Lord work, and what has He done? And so it was more in the rearview mirror that we established a lot of those things. And these staff these staff values are that way as well. Where like, it's like we've taught on Ephesians four so many different times. And so our first value we get we get paid to equip the church. And those six statements there um, were were all statements that we we. And I remember Ty when we were doing that, we had Ephesians four, uh, four open on our laptops, all of us were looking at it. We were walking through it and we were trying to figure out different statements. And at first that we we were like uh, two statements, three statements, it ended up being what, five, six bullet points. You said six bullet points. I think six per, per uh, value. uh, value. And so, and that was just kind of not a magic number, but just like, these are ways that we can articulate what it means to, we get paid to equip the church and, and how we can train our staff in that. And so that first one was, remind me of it. We, um, Uh, we understand the privilege of being called to, Equip Jesus Church. So what I did is I go into Ephesians four. This is last night. Like I'm literally, I got to finish the sermon for the week, uh, the notes, send them out. And I'm, I'm like trying to pump through, um, getting that teaching done. I'm here last night at like seven, eight o'clock in my office, working on it, trying to get across a goal. And so I don't have to wake up super early today before staff meeting at 10 and get it done. So I go to write on it. And so I open up Ephesians four. And again, <clears throat> I'm not, as we think about our staff values and how we're training our staff values, these are rooted in the scriptures. These are something that we're going to take from the scriptures. Like we're going to, we're not just, this isn't like the organizational leadership, latest organizational leadership book we've read on how to function as systems within an organization that we're going to be as the guiding principles. These are going to be biblical principles that we're living out and that we're training our staff in. And so Ephesians 4, I look at the text in Ephesians 4 and I'm looking at the wider context and Ephesians 4.1, um, that uh, as a prisoner of the Lord, he says, um, that we would live in the calling to which we have been called, right? And and live that walk out, walk in the calling to which we have been called. And so I started to work on that, and I started to go into that concept of calling, and um, and what that means biblically. And so that first bullet point just kind of blew up to this. What ended up there was enough content there. Where I was like, I just have to teach on this one. I can't get to the rest of these bullet points because the concept of of being called to equip Jesus Church starts with the concept of being called biblically, which the very first thing I noticed was like, this is not vocation. This is salvation, right? So calling in Ephesians 4, rooted in Ephesians 1, being called to the hope and the glorious inheritance in the saints. Like 
calling biblically is about salvation. That's salvation. You, you're called by Christ to Christ. You're, that's your calling, right? And so more so than like, hey, your calling is to do this. Your calling is based upon your utility or it's based on, or it is your vocation or whatever. Um, I realized that the emphasis of that first staff value teaching, that first bullet point needed to be our identity in Christ, um, being called to Christ, being made his own, um, belonging to Jesus. And that had to be the rooting of this idea we get paid to equip the church. Because if you, if it's rooted anywhere else, like it's going to be about what you do rather than who he's made you to be. And then your identity is going to be linked to your, your, your performance or your work or, or, or the bottom line or any of those things, which if your identity is rooted there, you've, you've lost the plot completely. So, so the whole teaching was just on being called, um, called to Christ and the privilege of being, uh, called his own and what that means for equipping the church, realizing that first and foremost, we are the church before we equip the church, we have to realize we are the church. And so the process of what he's doing in us is going to be as vital and important as anything he's going to do through us. And so I just kind of emphasizing that in the gospel and those things and kind of starting the identity there. So yeah, that's the route it went. And it, and it went that way because it was like, I just kept writing on that and I ended up doing the first three verses, kind of the mentality, humility, gentleness, all those things, bearing with one another in love. And just basically it, it exegeted and exposited those first three verses of Ephesians um, in that way to... Uh, to hammer home that first step value. Hmm. What do you think, Ben? I think it's great. Um, yeah, why, so that surprised you that he went that route? or? Well, I, I kind of, I think it's one of those things where it's like, you're like, oh, that's the, where you're going to go, huh? And then once you hear it, you're like, oh, that's a great place to start. Mm. Because like even the idea of having a staff and having values for said staff, it's like, where does it begin? It begins with our identity, not in the work we do, not in the staff element of it, but in our identity as Christians. Um, and so I, one of the follow-ups I wanted to, to ask is, um, you know, you, you talk about that idea of calling. Um, so somebody might hear that and, you know, every time they've heard the word calling in their, in the, in preaching or in the, in Christianity world, they might instantly go to vocation or like, what am I supposed to do with my life? Um, so why does that word not mean that in Ephesians four? Um, and, uh, and, and, and yeah, what does that mean? And does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I mean, the word doesn't mean that because I mean, you, you, when you are trying to figure out what that word means in context, you're looking at the light, the specific language, um, and, and how Paul is using that word in the concept or in the context of that letter and Ephesians four, one um, is rooted in Ephesians 1.18, which is all in the whole indicatives of the first three chapters of Ephesians, which are all about who you are in Christ, what what your identity is in Christ. And so, so yeah, I, I think you're right, Tyler. We've taken calling in our culture, and particularly in Christian culture, and we've made it about my impulse, the impulse that I feel that I attribute to being from the Lord, and that impulse is going to drive me to embrace a trajectory, um, a role, a mission, or something the, uh, like that, that is going to, um, I'm just gonna, man, I'm called to do this, so that's gonna be what inspires me to do this. And biblically speaking, in the New Testament, in the epistles of Paul and those things, where you see the word calling and the concept of calling that's not what it means. Like it means it's it's about your salvation in Christ. It's I mean calling. It's about being called by Christ to be His own, being called by God to to belong to Christ. And um, it, our modern conception, especially in the in the Christian world uh, of calling, it has has and, and it just has way less roots in in the scriptural idea of calling. So so I think it, it kind of has to be cleared up a little bit. And and certainly the Lord. You look at the Old Testament, the Lord calls the prophets to do things, and, and there, there, there is, there, I, I taught two weeks to our interns this last, last summer about calling, um, and, and there's a lot of, of things as it relates to calling that are, um, that are biblical, like a lot of uh, concepts, but uh, to, be, to be a Christian is to be called by God the Father through God the Spirit uh, to God the Son, and um, First uh, Corinthians one nine, which is actually the first place that the that that word is used in the epistles. God is faithful by whom you were called, 
into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that, that right there, by whom God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's, that's um, being conformed to the likeness of God's son or, or called to be saints or called to belong to Jesus Christ. These are, these are the ways the word call is used all throughout the epistles in the New Testament. So, so it's, it's, it's much more about salvation than it is about uh, vocation. Um, and um, let me drop some Edmund Clowney on you just real quick before you respond, Ben, uh, before you rebut. Um, Clowney says, uh, to understand your calling, consider what you are called. Every Christian has had God's name solely given to him solemnly given to him. He has been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's in um, Edmund Clowney's book, Called to the Ministry, right? So to consider mm. your calling, consider what you are called, right? Mm. And then he lists out, you know, we are called by God's grace. We are called according to his purpose. We are called to be saints together. We, you know, uh, in this calling, we are predestined by God, justified on our way to be glorified. We are called to freedom, Galatians 5. We are called to hope, a unique Hope that belongs to our calling, Ephesians one and four. So there's, you know, there's there's so many places, and it's kaleo. Generally, is the is the word used in, in the Greek in the New Testament, but it's that's what that means in those contexts, right? Called to holiness, First Thessalonians four. Called to eternal life, First Timothy six. You know, hmm. those are the things to which we are called. So if you search called everywhere there in the New Testament, you're not going to find like I am called to be a Chiefs fan. I think it's in the Book of Mormon, actually. But, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. In, in those first few verses of Ephesians 4, there's the calling um, that's kind of to the individual, um, but then also in verse 4, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so there's this call to... You as an individual, but then you're called to Christ, but you're also called to his body. That's why he's he's appealing here for unity and the spirit and the bond of peace. And so that's kind of the, you're called into this one body with this one hope to this one God. But then as it gets to verse 7, it then kind of seems to go from unity to diversity in the church. But grace was given to each one according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so we're all called to this one Christ, but that one Christ has given a variety of different gifts with the purpose of building up his church and equipping his church. And so you see kind of the unity and diversity within the church. We are all called to one God, but that one God through the Spirit gives us different gifts. So we're not, we're all the same as far as our salvation goes, but we're all different in the way that God has gifted all of us to build up the church. So yeah, that's that's cool. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I really like how you started there. And I think just practically, um, if your identity is not rooted in your calling to Christ and your identity in Christ, and it's rooted in, into your, your work of equipping, um, that's, that's a, dangerous, a dangerous road to go down because our calling in Christ is secure because it's based on Christ's work. If our calling... Uh, if if our identity is based on our work and what we think our job is to do, um, we're going to fail. We're going to fall short. Um, there's going to be ups and downs. And so anyone who's working in the church and, and wants to equip others, that's great. But that isn't your identity. And that's a real struggle in ministry. I've had that struggle, finding my identity and my work and my performance and what I'm doing for Christ and not in Christ. And um, that's just a roller coaster of ups and downs and hills and valleys because we don't always you know we get criticism and we don't always perform at our best or we make bad decisions and and so if our identity is rooted in what we do for god and we're gonna be all over the place but if it's rooted for in christ and who we are in him then we can be steady eddie right because that never changes that's the same regardless of how we how we perform yeah that's cool. good. I like the distinction you made there with the giftings in that same context, because that's like where it ends up, right? Of those specific roles we have to play within the church, you know, but rooted ultimately at the beginning, that idea of being called to Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So do you not like to use that word for your vocation? Like if someone oh. said, Andrew, when were you called to the ministry? Would you just kind of know what they mean? Like, and you would just go with it? Or would you, 
would you like would you clarify use different terminology I, I don't mind the terminology of called. I'm not there. There is a, a school of thinking, even some some people I really respect locally who hate that idea of calling. They're like, don't say it that way, you know, because it could because of some of the stuff we've just said. But but I do think um, our good friend Ron Mars. Yeah, <laughs> name dropped. I love Ron. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, but I do think that the I don't I don't shy away from the calling thing yeah. as long as it's not it doesn't become this super subjective. Yeah. Like, tell me what you mean by that. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But because I do think there are three things, three, three helpful categories as it relates to like calling convictions, character and competence. I get that from the Charles and the vine, Marshall and pain, but, but, um, to be called internally compelled, externally affirmed and unmistakably yeah. fruitful. That's the stuff I teach on that with our, with our, with our uh, interns is that that internal compelling, that, that feeling. Yeah. I, I, I certainly sensed a call to preach when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, and there was an inter a very strong internal compelling, right? The fire, uh, the 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 word of God shut up in my bones, you know, Jeremiah. Like there was that that real compelled, like I felt compelled to preach and compelled to to enter the ministry, to study, to do those things. Um, but then the second one, externally affirmed, is really big because that has to happen within the community. It's not, and that's that's where people get into trouble. Is this this overly individualized, subjective sense of like, no, I'm called to do this, no matter what anybody says. And that's the kind of so-called gospel of our culture is like, be true to yourself and whatever you feel, and don't let anybody tell you differently. And in the church, that's the, it should be the opposite. Like externally affirmed, affirmed in the community. Like like people going, yeah, I see that in you. I see that conviction, that character, that competence growing. Right. And, and that's big. And then unmistakably fruitful is the last one, which there's some killer Spurgeon quotes on that, where um, th that there's actual fruit from it. It's not just, I feel internally compelled and people are like, yeah, I see that in you. And then like, there's no fruit. Like there's, there's gotta be fruit, you know, that's connected to that. And, and that doesn't mean bigger, better, faster, or, or there's these certain pragmatic things that have to occur. But um, dude, the Spurge, man, um, I'm going to read, I'm going to read a little bit of this. Is that cool with you guys? Um, a little yeah. Spurgeon's lectures to my students. It is a marvel to me how men continue at ease in preaching year after year without conversions. Have they no bowels of compassion for others? No sense of responsibility upon themselves? Dare they by a vain misrepresentation of divine sovereignty cast the blame on their master? Or is it their belief that Paul plants in Apollos waters and God gives no increase? Vain are their talents, their philosophies, their rhetoric, and even their orthodoxy without the signs following. Um, how are they sent of God who bring no men to God? Prophets whose words are powerless, sowers whose seeds all wither, fishers who take no fish, soldiers who give no wounds. Are these God's men? <laughs> he just keeps going. But, but, uh, and that's in his lectures to my students on like the, the necessity that like, yes, you feel compelled and you're firm, but like that there's fruit, fruit in the ministry. And, and that doesn't have to take, as I said, this, some pragmatic timeline form, but that there's actual fruit, uh, over the long haul. So anyway. mm. it's good stuff. Nothing like this Burge dude on a Thursday mm -hmm. afternoon mm. or Friday morning for the listeners. What am I right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, well, we'll be back next week with our, uh, our Super Bowl preview <laughs> episode. Uh, but I, I can firmly say that when we started this 27 minutes ago, I did not think that we would be getting um, Spurgeon quotes with the word bowels in it. But, you know, here we are. Have they no bowels? Well, see you later. <laughs> <laughs>